Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, our topic today is a virtual workshop for precise HDR-mediated genome engineering with CRISPR-Cas9. My name is Louise Baskin. I'm a senior product manager here at DharmaCon, and I will be the moderator for today's broadcast. For anyone who's not familiar with us, DharmaCon has been supporting the RNA and gene modulation research community for over 20 years. We launched the very first synthetic CRISPR-Cas9 guide RNAs, and we now offer one of the most comprehensive CRISPR gene editing portfolios in the industry, uh, including the first array synthetic CRISPR RNA whole human genome library. We remain focused on the development and support of innovative, effective tools for the greater research community. For today's webinar, you can submit questions anytime during the event by typing them into the Q&A box. You just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We do have scientists standing by to answer your questions in real time, so you might also see a response in this window. Uh, some questions will be held until the end for the live Q&A session with our presenter. Any questions that don't get answered during the event will receive an email response from one of our technical support scientists. If you want to maximize your view, uh, the presentation window can be enlarged by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner. And if you experience any technical problems with the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right or submit the problem through that green Q&A button. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. And I'd now like to introduce today's speaker, Marin Mayer Gross. Marin is a scientist in the R&D group. She received her degree in biochemistry and molecular biology at the College of Worcester in 2004, and she joined DharmaCon in 2005. She's contributed to research projects and the development of new products in multiple areas across RNA interference as well as CRISPR-Cas9 genome engineering. And today she's going to take you through some virtual HDR experiments to provide some very practical advice on how to be successful with these applications. And I'll now turn it over to Marin for the presentation. Hello. Um, thank you for joining us today. And Louise, thank you for the introduction. Today, I will walk us through all the steps that we need to consider when planning HDR-mediated gene editing experiments with CRISPR-Cas9. Our goal here is to show you how we at DharmaCon have many resources and tools available to make these complex experiments easy to plan and design. As a scientist myself, this has made my life a lot easier, and I hope this is helpful for you too. For the agenda today, I will give a brief CRISPR-Cas9 refresher to make sure that we're all on the same page, then introduce some CRISPR-Cas9 applications utilizing the HDR repair pathway. Following this, I will step us through two virtual genome engineering experiments, and these will specifically showcase the web design tools built by our expert bioinformaticists and software developers here at DharmaCon. These virtual experiments will include designing repair template as a single-stranded donor oligo and also as a donor plasmid. For a quick introduction, starting in 2012, the first studies were published demonstrating that Streptococcus pyogenes CRISPR-Cas9 system can be adapted for use in human and mouse cells. Since then, there have been thousands of publications utilizing CRISPR-Cas9 in mammalian cells, as well as added editing genomes from other organisms. The utility of CRISPR-Cas9 has revolutionized how quickly we can knock out genes to address our biological questions. All right, so let's take a quick look at the mechanism. Um, so that all of the experimental components that we discussed today will make sense. In S. pyogenes, the CRISPR RNAs are transcribed and processed into short RNAs and, um, with a 20-nucleotide spacer-derived sequence and a 22-nucleotide repeat-derived sequence. Separately, a longer RNA called tracer is also transcribed. The CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA hybridize 
and then recruit the Cas9 nuclease, which uses the spacer-derived sequence as a guide to its DNA target. The target sequence is proximal to the three nucleotide protospacer adjacent motif, or PAM. Once all of the components are in place, the DNA is cleaved by the Cas9 nuclease and can be repaired by the cell's own repair pathway, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a few slides. To adapt this system for gene editing in mammalian cells, there are two required CRISPR-Cas9 components that need to be introduced, the Cas9 nuclease as well as the guide RNA. Previously, I mentioned the CRISPR RNA tracer RNA hybrid as it is the native system, but this technique can also be carried out using a chimeric single guide RNA, or sgRNA, as shown here on the right where the CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA are linked into a single piece. Single guide RNAs can either be expressed from a vector or chemically synthesized. Using synthetic single guide RNA or CRISPR tracer RNA can have several advantages over vector-based guide RNAs, including that they don't require any cloning and sequencing and are immediately ready to deliver into your cells for gene knockout or knock-in experiments. As I mentioned previously, when the Cas9 nuclease creates a double-strand break, the cell's own DNA repair mechanisms kick in. Two of the major pathways in mammalian cells for such repair are non-homologous end joining, or NHEJ, and homology-directed repair, or HDR. NHEJ may or may not result in perfect repair. Often, the site of cleavage has mutations due to insertions and deletions, or indels for short. This is sufficient for functional gene knockout experiments, where the desired outcome is an indel that results in a frame shift mutation. On the other hand, HDR is used for precise genome engineering, such as inserting a point mutation or generating a knock-in. It requires a donor DNA template for repair of the double-strand break. HDR typically has lower overall efficiency compared to NHEJ, but has the ability to result in a precise genomic edit. So for HDR, in addition to the Cas9 and guide RNA, the donor or repair template is also required. For the remainder of this talk, we will focus on experiments designed to utilize the HDR pathway. Here are just a few of the ways researchers are using HDR, making alterations or corrections of disease alleles, insertion or removal of a SNP, attaching an affinity tag to a gene to study protein interactions or to carry out purifications. Also, you can knock in a fluorescent reporter to visualize the location of your protein or the localization of your protein in your cell, um, as well as changing exons to study their effect on cellular pathways or diseases. Depending on what type of application you're doing, there are different reagents that should be used as donors for precise repair. In general, for small insertions, deletions, or replacements, single-stranded DNA oligos are used. For larger knock-ins, plasma donors are recommended because they are more suited for larger payloads. Currently, more research is ongoing um, looking at different sources of donor templates, but today we will go over the design of these two classic types of repair templates. And we'll do this in our virtual HDR genome engineering experiments. The two experiments that we will walk through today are to introduce a SNP in our gene of interest using a single-stranded DNA oligo as a donor template. And second, we will design a plasmid, a plasmid donor to knock in a fluorescent reporter in frame with our gene of interest. The basic workflow starts with choosing the appropriate type of CRISPR reagents and then designing guide RNAs to test for functionality in the region of the HDR insertion. We will also need to design the repair template. This will be the main focus of the rest of the workshop. Next, 
we need to co-transfect co our Cas9, guide RNA, and repair template into our cells. And then finally, we will detect and verify the intended genomic alteration. All right, so let's start with our first step, which is to choose the most appropriate CRISPR-Cas9 components. Dharmacon provides a wide range of these reagents through our editor product line. We have Cas9 nuclease available as protein, mRNA, lentiviral particles, and plasmids. We also have multiple formats of guide RNA, including synthetic CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA, synthetic single guide RNA, and lentiviral particles and plasmids that express the single guide RNA. And then for HDR repair templates, we have single-stranded DNA donor oligos for those smaller genomic alterations, and plasmid donor kits for the larger insertions. And then we also have an option where you can insert your own custom sequence. Although all of these reagents are good for other applications, the end goal of an HDR experiment is to make a clonal cell line with a desired alteration. Because of this, for HDR-specific applications, we recommend using Cas9 protein or mRNA with a synthetic guide RNA. These sources give high editing efficiencies, which is important because the HDR repair will be a fraction of the total repair. Additionally, these reagents have a quick turnover that can reduce potential off-target effects from persistent expression of Cas9 or the guide RNA after the desired knock-in occurs. And finally, there will be no integration of trans or transient expression of Cas9 or guide RNA components in your final altered clonal cell line. All right, so an important step that goes hand-in-hand -hand with choosing CRISPR-Cas9 reagents is optimizing their transfection into your specific cell lines. There are many factors that need to be optimized for cellular transfection, including cell density, Cas9 amount, guide RNA amount, and then potentially the transfection method, if you're choosing between different transfection reagents or you might require electroporation. And you may already have good delivery conditions for your cell line that can be used as a starting point. But here is an example of transfection optimization, as we recommend performing if you're starting with a completely new cell type. In this chart, we're looking at cell viability using Cas9 mRNA with a positive control CRISPR tracer RNA targeting PPIB. We use Darmafect Duo transfection reagent in U2OS cells. Darmafect Duo is formulated for co-transfection, and we use it all the time for Cas9 protein and mRNA with synthetic guide RNA. All right, so in addition to viability, the editing efficiency should also be assessed when we're optimizing our transfections. To look at the PPIB editing, a T7E1 mismatch detection assay was run on all conditions to compare the relative editing of the positive control. On the right, I'm showing a small subset of the editing results from the lipid amount of 0.3 microliters per well. What we can see is that although the viability across these different CRISPR tracer RNA amounts was equivalent, we actually see the best editing with a 25 nanomolar amount. The trick to transfection optimization is finding a balance between viability and editing. Often, the highest viability also shows low editing. In our experience, somewhere around 80% viability generally it gives good editing efficiency while maintaining healthy cells. Okay, now that we have the transfection conditions in our cell type that give efficient editing with a positive control, we can design our guide RNAs. And then just so we're clear, the guide RNA design steps are the same for both the experiments that I'm demonstrating today. So I will only go through these steps once. In a moment, I'll show you how this is all done with the Dharmacon CRISPR design tool. But first, I will walk us through all the steps that you would need to have to carry out if you didn't have our design tool to do it for you. First, you would need to obtain the genomic DNA sequence 
and determine the location for your specific alteration. Next, you need to identify the PAMs in that genomic region in close proximity to the insertion or alteration site. Ideally, we want the guide RNA cut site to be within 10 base pairs of insertion. Typically, the closer they are, the better HDR efficiency is observed. Now, in some genomic locations, there won't be a PAM site near the cut site. So in those cases, we will have to choose the nearest available options and anticipate having lower efficiency, which means characterizing more clonal cell lines in your downstream applications. This illustration indicates the availability of three PAMs. Therefore, three potential guide RNA target sites are near our alteration site. With these three guide RNAs in mind, we'll next check for specificity to reduce the possibility of cleaving at another genomic location. For this, we need to use a sequence alignment tool um, that will look for full or partial alignment against the whole genome. And then, just as a reminder, the rigor of the publicly available tools will vary quite a bit. So it's possible that we might miss some genomic off-targets <clears throat> that only have partial complementarity. Then we need to test these available guide RNAs for functionality. For that, we go back to our optimized transfection conditions and run a mismatch detection assay to find the guide RNA with the best editing efficiency. Finally, we choose the most functional and specific guide RNA that's nearest to our alteration site. In this illustration, we would select guide RNA number two because it gave us the best editing efficiency and presumably acceptable specificity. And then it also has the added benefit of the cut site being very close to our desired alteration. All right, so the workflow that we just walked through can be time-consuming and even confusing if you're new to this sort of experimental design. Um, let me now show you how easy it is um, with our CRISPR design tool uh, for guide RNA. So now I'm going to move away from my slides and show a live demonstration. Just give me a second to set up my desktop share. There we go. All right, so we're at our website, for, and we're going to choose the CRISPR design tool. And the CRISPR design tool is a wizard-type tool that will walk us through all the steps to design our guide RNAs. And, um, and then we can order either our synthetic single guide RNAs, our synthetic CRISPR RNAs, or lentiviral single guide RNA. <clears throat> So in the beginning here, we have to choose our design options. And so there are four different choices. The first one is to input your gene ID or gene symbol to design anywhere within your gene. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the second one is to input, and so the first, the first option is typically used for knockout experiments. <clears throat> and then the second one, um, input your gene ID or gene symbol specific cleavage location for HDR is the tool, is the pathway that I'm going to lead us through today. Um, and then there's a third option where we can provide a DNA region for design. And um, our tool can design to up to 30 species, or more than 30 species actually. And so if you're working with something that's unannotated that isn't part of those 30 species, this is where um, someone might just insert that region for designs only in that area. And then the fourth option is to input your own guide RNA sequence. All right, so we'll just keep going here. So the next step is to specify your organism. And you can see here this drop-down box comes up with all the organisms that we can um, choose between. If you start typing in, um, the organism you want to work with, then you can select it from the box, the drop-down box. And we can do the same thing for our gene target. And then for today's demonstrations, I'm going to use the gene CDKN1A, and then select that from the drop-down list again. 
All right, and so then with this experiment, since I'm doing one design for both, both of our virtual experiments, um, I'm going to go ahead and click this checkbox. And it's only required for if you're using HDR donors. Um, but since I'm doing both, I'm going to go ahead and click it and proceed. All right. So now we have this nice visualization of our, um, of our gene. And above here, we have um, introns in green, exons in blue, and then the dark blue is the coding region. And we can, um, you see this red selection window? We can click on the, the transcript above, and then below we can see a more detailed view of, um, of the transcript. We can also zoom in or zoom out um, in this above view. But once we find the location that we want our genomic alteration, then we go down to this view below, and we will click um, in the location that we want to change. Now, for the two examples that we're going through today, one of them um, is we're just going to introduce a SNP. Um, and, and so I'll walk us through that first. Um, and the other one uh, will be the fluorescent insertion, and so we want this to be an N-terminal fluorescent insertion. So I'm going to pick uh, guide RNAs that are near this N-terminal, but in the first example, we'll um, do a SNP. So in my first example, I want to change this T to something else, so I'm going to click right here. All right, so here we have all of the guide RNA um, designs populated um, close to our insertion or alteration site that we've chosen. And we're um, providing a lot of information in this view. So I can just walk us through the legend pretty quickly before we, um, before we go ahead and choose. And so the guide RNAs look like um, an arrow. And at the tail of the arrow, we have our specificity ranking. And the specificity ranking will either be visualized as high, medium, or low. And it uses our Dharmacon alignment tool. And this alignment tool gives fully comprehensive specificity checking. And so um, we can be confident that we're not hitting anywhere else in the genome. And in all of the results that we have here, everything is high. Um, and so that doesn't even have to be a factor in our choices for this example. And then the other side of the arrow, we have a functionality rank. And those rankings are, are numbered, and number one is the highest rank. And the way that we come up with this functionality rank is based on the editor functionality algorithm balanced with the distance from the CRISPR cut site to our alteration site. And so this is really based on you know, where specifically you want your alteration to be. Um, and these are the best um, functional guide RNAs in that location. And so, um, so then because we have high specificity and we want to balance that with our functionality, we can go ahead and choose our top three rated um, functionality uh, guide RNAs. So then I'll do that and I'll um, go to the next screen. And then here we have it in a table format where we can see our um, we can see our designs. And I'm just going to go ahead and copy and copy this one for later on in the demo. But um, and then at this point we can choose our format. So we can choose CRISPR RNA, lentiviral single guide RNA, where we could have either glycerol stock or um, high titer lentiviral particles or our synthetic single guide RNA, which comes in a one nanomole amount. So for this example, we'll go ahead and just use CRISPR tracer RNA. And here we can choose between 2 and 20 nanomole size for the three CRISPR RNAs that we're going to order. We can add those to our cart. And then I can scroll down a little bit and, um, and rem remember to choose, if, you, if we don't already have synthetic tracer that's required with the CRISPR, 
we can go ahead and order that as well. And in this case, we can order larger amounts because this is the universal component. We can go ahead and add that to our cart too. And then I guess I should mention that there's this plate format option. And so that is if you have more than 20, 20 or more CRISPR RNA designs, um, you can order it in a plate format and, um, and it will come delivered to you in a 96 well plate format. So you would just choose that here. Um, and so then we can just go to our cart and check out and we're done. So uh, now I'm going to end the screen sharing and get back to them. All right. Okay, so now that we've designed our guide RNAs, let's move on to the next step in our virtual experiment, where we will introduce our SNP. As a quick recap, for this experiment, we will use Cas9 mRNA, the synthetic two-part guide RNA, and a single-strand DNA repair template to serve as our donor for HDR. Now we're ready to design our repair template. Again, I will walk us through all the steps of doing the design, and then I will demonstrate using the Dharmacon HDR Donor Designer to carry this out more easily. So for the first step, we go back to the genomic DNA sequence surrounding the gene alteration site. We capture this sequence, including homology sequence on either end, and incorporate the desired alteration. In this illustration, I'm showing our introduced SNP in blue, changing one base to an A. For DNA oligo donors, we need to consider the sequence base for homology arms. Here on the right, I'm showing you the results from an experiment that we performed on two different genes to determine the optimal homology arm length. From these data, we concluded that 30 to 40 nucleotides of homology on either end are sufficient for optimal incorporation by HDR. Next, we should double check for any errors in design. For instance, if your donor adds a base but doesn't also remove a base, you will end up with a frame shift mutation and introduce a premature stop codon, as shown here on the right when what we really wanted to do was just modify one codon. Finally, it is important to make sure that Cas9 doesn't continue to cut the HDR repair DNA. This is possible if the guide RNA recognition site and the PAM are within one of the homology arms, like in this example shown. Luckily, there are strategies to prevent this. The easiest way to avoid this is if the change we are making naturally disrupts the guide RNA targeting site. In this case, where the guide RNA is indicated by the gray shaded area, we're showing an insertion of 12 bases, which falls within the guide RNA targeting sequence. So the guide RNA it ha no longer has complementarity. When the guide RNA targeting site will still be intact after the alteration occurs, one or more silent mutations are required to avoid continued cutting of the desired product. And then because the Cas9 protein first recognizes the PAM sequence before looking for additional complementarity, it's recommended to first attempt to make the silent mutation to change the PAM. In this example, we modify the donor oligo to change the PAM from CGG to CGC. So the arginine amino acid is preserved but the PAM is not recognizable. Finally, if the PAM site is not available for a silent mutation, then the next proximal codon should be changed, and so on throughout the guide RNA. We also recommend two silent mutations if the PAM and the seed region of the guide RNA cannot be changed. This example changes GGG to GGA, preserving the glycine amino acid, but disrupting the first nucleotide of the seed. Okay, that might have seemed like a lot of information, but now that I've introduced all the design considerations for donor oligos, let me show you how easy this is to do with our HGR donor designer um, with another live demonstration here. So I will get my desktop share going again. So here we are at our HDR donor designer. 
and we're going to choose the Oligo option. All right, and so then this is similar to the um, design tool where we can just enter our species from a drop-down list and then choose it from below. The same thing with our gene target, CDKN1A. All right, and then um, we can uh, choose a different transcript if, if wanted, but um, the default is always the primary transcript. And we'll just continue with that. And then here I'm going to paste in that guide RNA that we selected in the previous demonstration. Um, and we're pretending that this one is the one that was the best when we tested it on our own. Um, out of those three, we picked this one as our, our big winner. All right, and so then now we have a visualization again of the genomic region surrounding our um, guide RNA. And then we have this um, slider bar where we can um, change our insertion uh, or alteration location. And so in this example, we want to change this T to an A. So we'll, we'll type in an A here in this um, in this uh, space for sequence to insert. And then we can change the length of our five prime or three prime homology arm. We can go ahead and click generate DNA donor. And I'll scroll down a little bit. All right, and so what we can see here is maybe one of those common errors that someone could make where they're um, introducing uh, an A, but, but here I forgot to remove the T. So now I don't have a silent mutation. I have a frame shift, frame shift mutation. And um, it's indicated here in the design tool. So it'll stop us from making that mistake. And so what we do is unlock the slider bar. And then we can position the slider bar to surround the DNA that we want to remove. And once we do that, then it, it shows up here in the field below. And so now we have our donor sequence, and it's down here. We're going to select it so we can order it. And um, we can see our point mutation where we're changing our serine amino acid to a threonine amino acid in this, in this example. And um, in the parentheses here, 61 is the length of this donor sequence. So we can go through and um, you know, pretend to check out with this one. So we'll give it a unique, a unique name. So CDKN1A uh, donor 1. And here we can select our scale, 0.5 or 1 micromole scale. So this is synthesis scale. And so the final yield um, just depends on the length of your oligo. And then you can choose to have HPLC purification or not. And we have shown that the purification isn't, isn't required. And then the next option here is to include stabilizing modifications. And then this is something that we do recommend to improve HDR functionality. Um, and it consists of two phosphothiolate linkages that are on either end of the donor oligo. And then we can just add to our cart. And that's the end. Well, nope. Actually, let me show you one more example where um, I'm going to get back to our CRISPR designs from the last one and choose a different design. So I can show you how we can easily introduce those silent mutations. And now we'll say display target region again. And so now you can see that um, this guide RNA is shifted away from our desired alteration site. So if we set this up again to change our T to an A to correct our SNP, we now have many more alternative donor sequences and a recommended donor sequence that has this blue highlighted area here where we've introduced a SNP. And, um, and the way that 
we do this is how we've recommended it and how I just talked about it before, where we're going to introduce a silent mutation in the PAM and then walk down the guide RNA um, through the seed, and then we would have two mismatches, um, two SNPs after that region. Um, but really, there, if, unless there is a reason that you wouldn't want the recommended donor sequence because that um, specific um, SNP is unacceptable for your application, you should always go ahead and choose the recommended donor sequence. All right, so now we're done with this part of the demo. And I'll go to our slides. All right, so now that we have all the components that we need to generate our precision edited cell line, um, we're ready to go ahead and uh, do our co-transfection because we've already optimized our conditions for delivery with our Cas9 mRNA and our CRISPR tracer RNA. And now all we have to do is add in the donor oligo and figure out what that optimal concentration should be. And so on the right is an example of this type of experiment using cells with stable ex Cas9 expression. And um, the oligo concentrations that we used ranged up to 100 nanomolar. And this is shown on the x-axis. And the total HDR percent is reported on the y-axis. And then, as you can see, the, donor, um, the DNA donor oligo concentrations ranging between 2.5 and 10 nanomolar give the most efficient HDR integration. So this is our ongoing recommendation for DNA oligo concentration that you'll find in all of our protocols for lipid transfections. After the CRISPR and HDR donor, donor components have been delivered in our co-transfection, um, we'll then need to perform clonal cell isolation and colony expansion. And this is how you get a homogeneous population that you can then characterize for your desired alteration. In this case, a SNP change. Depending on the expected HDR percentage, the appropriate number of clones should be expanded and then Sanger sequenced with primers flanking the desired genomic alteration. Here, in this example of Sanger sequencing, we're showing a homozygous correction of a SNP. Now, it's not usually that easy, and so I wanted to show an, an example from another experiment where it's showing examples of the varied sequencing results that we often get from clonal cell lines. In this case, we inserted an NHE1 restriction site with a 1x flag tag at the C-terminal end of the EMX1 gene. Keep in mind that the maximum HDR percentage will be less than the original percent editing by the Cas9 and guide RNA alone, and that during the process of clonal isolation, clones will drop out for many reasons, such as more than one cell per well, your single cells are not growing, or the desired alteration is only um, present in a subset of alleles or there are other mutations in addition to the desired alteration. So it's recommended to carry several clonal cell lines through to Sanger sequencing. Here we see three different outcomes in the Sanger sequencing analysis. The first one is the wild type, or no insertion at all. The second one is a heterozygous example of evidence, um, with evidence of the insertion on at least one allele, but the other allele or alleles have different mutations. And then the third example is the actual desired homozygous clone, where all the alleles contain the insertion. All right, so that brings us to the end of our first virtual experiment. We covered a lot, so just a quick recap of what we've done so far um, was optimizing our transfection conditions using the, and then using our CRISPR design tool for guide RNAs specific for HDR using the donor designer to order a single-stranded DNA donor oligo. Then we transfected everything together in our HDR experiment and finished up with the clonal isolation and Sanger sequencing to confirm our correction. And then on the right, I've listed the recommended conditions to start with that we also have listed in all of our manuals and protocols. All right. So now we can talk about the second virtual experiment, 
where we will use a plasmid repair template to create a fluorescent gene fusion. For this experiment, we will demonstrate using Cas9 protein, the synthetic two-part guide RNA, and the MK2 plasmid repair template. I'm not going to repeat any of the steps for the guide RNA design or transfection optimization, um, because those steps, again, are the same regardless of the type of repair template being used. So we're going to jump right into the design um, and then assemble our plasmid donor for, for, for fluorescent knock-in. All right, so as with the donor oligo, I will again walk us through all the steps of design as if we're doing it on our own, and then I'll show you how simple it is to do this with our donor designer. First, we need to obtain the genomic DNA sequence. In this example case, we want to add MK2 to the C terminus of CDK um, N1A. Uh, the guide RNAs that we chose, remember though, I, were designed to the N terminal um, as an N terminal alteration, but I thought I would walk us through kind of both, both ends for this design process. Um, all right, so then the next thing that we have to do with our genomic DNA is make sure that we have additional genomic sequence um, on either end. So we need to retrieve um, enough genomic sequence so that we can have our desired homology arm lengths. And um, from recent publications and what we recommend, um, this should be between 500 and 1,000 base pairs. All right, so now we need to design our PCR primers to amplify the desired homology arms from the cell type that will be used. The small diagram at the top right of this slide shows a schematic of how the primers need to be designed. And this is shown by both sets of the blue arrows. Um, and then for plasmid assembly, we need to append adapter sequences to the primers as well. And these are shown by the red tails and the yellow tails following those blue arrows. I will take us through step by step. First, we choose our insert adjacent primers, or those that are complementary to the DNA immediately adjacent to the site of the MK2 insertion. And these are shown on the larger diagram with the green arrows here. Next, we choose the gene-based portion of the corresponding primer pair. And in that case, there can be multiple options depending on the desired homology arm length and the PCR conditions. This is because there's plenty of sequence space, both five prime and three prime of the insertion site. In this example, the five prime homology arm amplicon will be 865 bases, and the three prime, three prime amplicon will be 552. Now that we have the gene specific um, parts of our primer pairs determined, we have to append the adapters that are specific to the donor for each of the primers. Here are the five prime homology arm primers, and here are the three prime homology arm primers with those adapters um, included. Now this step can be tricky because it's easy to make a manual error when you're appending the adapter sequence and even getting them in the correct orientation. All right, and so then, again, the last step, um, like I presented earlier, is to check um, and modify the primers, if needed, to include silent mutations to avoid this ongoing cleavage of the corrected DNA. And this is very similar to the guidelines I presented earlier. But the main difference is that the silent mutations need to be incorporated into primers um, and not simply the donor oligo. So first, again, and easiest, is the case where the insertion naturally disrupts the guide RNA targeting site, shown in gray. In this case, no modification needs to be made to the primer design, because the MK2 will be inserted in the middle of the guide RNA targeting site. Alternatively, and as we discussed earlier, when the guide RNA targeting site will still be intact after the insertion, one or more silent mutations are required to avoid this continued cutting of the desired product. So here, we again recommend to first attempt to make a silent mutation to the PAM. In this example, we're using the primer design to change the PAM from ADG 
to AGA, so the arginine amino acid is preserved, but the PAM is no longer recognizable. And then again, if the PAM site is unable to be changed, and the, um, then the next proximal codon should be changed, and so on, throughout the guide RNA. Um, and again, we recommend you know, two silent mutations if the PAM and the seed cannot be changed. In this example, we're changing CTA to CTC, preserving the leucine amino acid, but disrupting the um, first nucleotide of the seed. And then again, this is the same as I discussed before, but the silent mutations are introduced with the primers um, with mismatches. All right, so here we go. Um, now that we've seen all the design considerations and that it's even more complicated for plasmids, let me show you how easy this is to do with our donor designer um, for plasmid. And let me, all right, so now in this case, we are going to choose the um, donor designer for plasmid. And then this is very similar to the oligo tool. We're going to select human again from the drop down, our gene target. And we're going to keep with the primary transcript. And now here, our sequence to insert, we can choose from either MK2, EGFP, or this custom insert. And then I'll just show you how the custom insert works, where all you have to do is copy and paste your sequence that's more than 50 nucleotides into this text box. And, um, and then that'll be used for the primer design. Um, one of the things I should say is that it is, if you're working with anything that's 50 nucleotides or, or less, or just a little bit over 50 nucleotides, um, it's best to go ahead and use the oligo design tool um, because it's a lot less work. And then um, the other thing that I need to mention is that uh, the sequence that you enter here needs to be something that you have yourself. It's not something that we would synthesize, synthesize and provide. So that is um, not included in our kits. And so here I'll just go back to the MK2 um, sequence to insert, and I will paste in our guide RNA target sequence. All right, so then the view here is very similar to what we saw before, where we have our introns and our ex exons and um, our start of our coding region here. And so what we do is we move our um, slider bar. In this case, it's indicating what we're inserting, which is the MK2. We move it to the location that we want. And then we go ahead and generate primers. All right. So here we are with our primers. So here we have to choose now our, our pairs for our five prime homology arms and our three prime homology arm primer pairs. And like I said before, the insert adjacent primers are, um, are fixed. And so there aren't you know, other options for those. And so you can see here, this sequence ends with this ATG. And so it's the sequence here. And then the insert, the forward two primer starts with this sequence here. But then in blue, we can see that that is the silent mutation that was automatically um, incorporated into the design. Because in this case, our um, guide RNA would not be disrupted by the insertion of MK2 because it's fully intact in the three prime homology arm here. So we would go ahead and choose, choose those two. And then we need to choose our distal primers. And, um, and so typically, you want to choose the top one um, because these are ranked based on, um, uh, based on PCR quality scores from primer three. And so I would go ahead and pick the top one. But what you can do is look over here on, on the right where we have our, our TMs and the length. And so these are the lengths of the homology arms. 
so you can um, you can you can see that. But if for some reason um, you wanted uh, a longer homology arm, you could choose you could choose a different one. And in some cases, you might want to choose a couple um, a couple different primer pairs to start out with, so that you have backup options if if you're having trouble with the PCR. Um, but in this case, we'll just choose the two pairs. And then what we need to do is make sure that we have our donor kit included. Um, and then, of course, if, if you're coming back to order new primers um, and you already have the kit, you can deselect this at that point. And then we can go ahead and give it a unique name again. So I guess I would call this primer set Primer set one, and then I could go ahead and add to my cart. So that's how easy this is. I'll get back to the presentation shop and actually build our donor. Okay, so now that we've designed and ordered our custom homology arm primers and the HDR donor kit, we're ready to build the donor plasmid. The first step is to PCR amplify the homology arms from our cell's genomic DNA and gel purify the expected product. We then need to remember that the full length product will include the full length homology arm as well as the adapters. So there's going to be about 50 nucleotides um, addition to those um, homology lengths when you're analyzing it on the gel. All right, so next um, we'll combine, combine all those components, both homology arms, the MK2 insert, and the backbone um, for a four-fragment Gibson assembly. Both the vector backbone and the insert will arrive as part of the HDR plasma donor kit, um, but the kit doesn't provide the Gibson assembly reagents. Um, so uh, at that point, then we'll transform it into bacteria, and the next day, perform our colony PCR with the primers that are also included in that HDR donor kit. This gel on the left shows the colony PCR analysis for 10 clones, where A is the 5 prime arm and B is the 3 prime arm. As you can see, all but two of the clones indicate the expected size has been inserted for both arms. Next, Sanger sequence a few of the clones that appear positive to confirm the correct assembly. And then the final step is to prep the confirmed plasmid for transfection. So then as a quick recap on the kits to create donor plasmids, the HDR donor kit contains the custom and catalog items you need to amplify your homology arms, assemble and QC your donor plasmid. Each kit contains enough to do 10 reactions, so you would only need to do the design of your primers um, and then you can pr purchase, um, purchase those separately, but you, so you could do, you know, 10 different knock-ins with one of the donor kits. All right, so then similar to our oligo transfection, we now can do our real HDR experiment where we transfect everything together, um, but we need to include our plasmid and optimize our delivery conditions, including that plasmid. So in this example, I'm showing the results from a slightly different knock-in experiment than the virtual one we just did, so bear with me. Here we did a delivery by electroporation in K562 cells with the plasmid donor to create an EGFP fusion with the lamin A gene. On the left, you can see an increase in EGFP expression as the amount of donor plasmid is increased. And then on the right, you can look at um, where we used facts to quantify the percentage of EGFP positive cells. And we can observe um, an HDR rate as high as 32%. And then from this highest population of EGFP positive cells, we can go on to do clonal isolation and Sanger sequencing to confirm the insert. And then grow up this new cell line for future desired experiments. Lamin A is a structural protein in the nucleus, and although it's hard to visualize the suspension cells, it's evident that the localization is in the nucleus from applying Hooke's 
staining and merging the images as shown here. And then finally, there are several more examples of fluorescent knock-ins that we have generated with an HDR donor plasmid um, with our synthetic guide RNAs and either Cas9 nuclease mRNA or protein. On the left, we see a GFP beta actin fusion where we can clearly see actin filament structure. Next, we see a GFP HMGA fusion with a bright nuclear localization and on the right, we see both GFP and MK2 SEC61B fusions with distinct localization in the endoplasmic reticulum. So in the second virtual experiment, we focus mainly on the design and assembly of the donor plasmids, since we covered all the other steps in experiment one. But what we accomplished was, using the donor designer, to design compatible primer pairs to easily generate a donor plasmid utilizing our HDR donor kit. Next, we transected all the components that were, um, we transected all the components for these HDR experiments. And then um, I showed several examples of successful gene fusions. And then again on the right, I have listed the experimental recommendations that can be found in our technical manuals and protocols um, for these types of experiments. So that was a lot to cover. Thanks for sticking with me. I think I managed to cover everything you need to get started with HDR-mediated CRISPR-Cas9 experiments, including designing and testing guide RNAs for HDR applications, designing and ordering appropriate repair templates, and detection and verification of the desired HDR edit in a cell population. I have hopefully demonstrated how intuitive and helpful the DharmaCon online tools are, um, and they can really help do a lot of heavy lifting when it comes to guide RNA and HDR donor design for oligos or plasmids. Our team has worked really hard on these to overcome a lot of the day-to-day -day challenges of doing these designs properly and helping to avoid common errors. We just hope that this is helpful for you too. And when you come to our website and start playing around with the design tools, please take a look at our growing collection of resources, including all these application notes, um, that, and several of them um, have some of the examples that I walked through today um, with our HDR workflows. And then you can also find references to peer-reviewed publications from our R&D team and collaborators. And lastly, since you've already shown interest in webinars, be sure to check out our collection of other recorded webinars covering a number of talk topics that we hope um, will interest you as you plan your future experiments. And with that, Louise, I'm done and ready to take any questions. And thank right, you great. to everyone for your attention. Yes, thank you, Marin. That was so All much right. good information. Uh, um, we, we did use up a lot of our time, um, but we will uh, give you a minute to catch your breath. We will do a few questions. Um, while we get ready for that, there are two polling questions that will appear on your screen. We really appreciate you answering these. Um, just click the most appropriate response. And you can still submit questions by typing them into that Q&A box. Just click on that green. Q&A button at the lower left. Um, as I mentioned, all of the questions will be answered uh, via email that we don't get to today. Um, all right, Marion, here we go. Um, just a few of these here. Are the conditions you mentioned for the amount of CRISPR RNA, oligodonor, and Cas9 protein going to be the same for all cell types? Okay, yeah, good question. Um, the conditions that I mentioned are a good starting point, and in our hands, they've been fairly similar for the handful of, you know, immortalized cell lines that we use all the time. However, I can't emphasize enough how important optimization is. So if you're having trouble in your cell line, make sure that you start at the beginning of this workflow that I presented today, and then optimize everything for maximal HDR incorporation. Awesome, okay. Next, should I label the C or the N terminus of my gene? Okay, yeah, let's see. Um, my suggestion would be to just 
do a few searches to see if any other groups have already made NRC terminal fusions of, you know, your, the gene that you're working with. Um, and if so, I would go ahead and start with those conditions that previously worked. Um, if no one has published this, then, you know, you can go ahead and try designs to both ends. Um, or you could also get lucky and find, you know, a crystal structure of the protein, and then maybe you could infer if one end or the other would be more available for tagging. Um, and okay. then speaking of that, I should, sorry, Louise, I should also mention nope. that our design includes um, flexible amino acids on either end. So um, fusion proteins made with our designs will not be a direct fusion. And because of this flex flexibility, they'll be more functional, hopefully, right? Oh, so good that's information, a good, yes. good point. Yeah. Um, okay, so one more. Um, you showed an example where a frame shift that's introduced could introduce a premature stop codon. Might this be a strategy for doing gene knockout? Sure, sure, yeah. Um, that could definitely be a strategy for gene knockout. Um, but keep in mind the efficiency of repair pathways. If your goal is knockout but you don't care how, it would likely be more efficient to rely on NHEJ. Mm -hmm. But if you want to knock out your protein in a very specific way, um, then designing a single-strand DNA donor oligo that will introduce a premature stop codon would be, you know, a great strategy. Great. Okay. Well, we've, we've gone a little bit over, so thank you again for the great presentation. Um, thanks to the audience for your questions and for your attention. Um, if anyone thinks of more questions later and needs to contact us, please do just visit our website. Um, you have information there where you can call directly or email or chat online with one of our tech support scientists. On behalf of the whole DharmaCon team, we want to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Uh, and the webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through February. You'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you to when the webcast is available for on-demand. So if you have any colleagues who missed today's event that might be uh, interested, we invite you to forward that email announcement to them or just send them to our website. Thanks again for joining. I hope everyone has a great day.